tonight, China cancels national holiday celebrations because of the coronavirus. We get a first-hand look at how officials here will test for it. There are some cases that are under a further examination. It's a sign that our system is working. Plus, some Canadians are wearing their concern on their faces. Another day, another dropout in the Conservative leadership race. What is going on? That issue is here. I think the defense is going very quickly, hoping to have her trip up. A well-known actor takes on Harvey Weinstein in court. And the drama at the Grammys. That's just such a blatant conflict of interest. Wait till you hear the other accusations. This is The National. At least 25 people have died, more than 800 are infected, and thousands more have likely been exposed. Yeah, that strain of coronavirus that has captured the world's attention is still spreading outwards from central China. But after a second emergency meeting today, the World Health Organization decided not to ring the global alarm. Make no mistake, this is, though, an emergency in China. But it has not yet become a global health emergency. China is imposing severe travel restrictions, affecting tens of millions of its people, including the large city of Huanggang. That's just east of Wuhan, where the first outbreak happened about three weeks ago. Now, the overwhelming majority of confirmed cases are still within China's borders, but the virus has spread to Japan, Thailand, South Korea, the United States, and now Vietnam and Singapore. Canada has no confirmed cases, but the government says it is ready. We're working with international partners as well to ensure uh, that we have the best response possible. Now, the Chinese government, often notoriously secretive, has been praised by the WHO during the outbreak. They say it was quick to act and share vital information with the rest of the world. But the cost of that vigilance is high. Sasha Petrasek takes us inside Wuhan, a city of 11 million people now under lockdown. Thousands scrambled to catch the last planes and trains out of Wuhan this morning, slipping out before the quarantine kicked in. Before this city, ground zero for the coronavirus epidemic, was isolated in an unprecedented move by China. Inside now, face masks are mandatory. Large gatherings, forbidden. And on the streets, scenes of Wuhan's medical emergency. People here are accepting the lockdown, says this Spanish journalist. Everyone has been very supportive of the action that the government has taken. Everyone's sure that they're doing their best they can. They're doing it for, for, for public safety. Still, with the city cut off, some resources are already strained. A Turkish visitor to Wuhan captured empty market stalls. No food left, she says. People are buying in a panic. And while officials try to identify those with high fever and signs of infection, others describe overcrowded clinics and hospitals. People worried about their health, jamming an unprepared system. Outside this most affected region, there's an unusual emptiness in cities like Beijing. People are simply staying home. I'm getting more and more nervous, she says. This virus is so serious, we're scared. By far, most new infections are still in and around Wuhan, but numbers in the rest of China, including Beijing, are growing. In order to try to slow that spread, the Chinese government is banning all big celebrations for Lunar New Year, despite its huge significance. Sasha Petrasek, CBC News, Beijing. The public health officials in Canada are determined not to repeat past mistakes. Don't forget, this coronavirus belongs to the same genetic family as SARS, which hit this country hard in 2003. Christine Birak explains how key data shared by China is helping Canada prepare in a way that it couldn't before. Sick patients who have traveled to China are now landing in Canadian emergency rooms. The fact that there are some cases that are under a further examination is actually a good sign. It's a sign that our system is working. Within days of the first case in China, scientists there decoded the new virus, revealing its genetic blueprint. With that knowledge, Canadian researchers quickly developed tests. 
Now, just weeks into this outbreak, doctors can tell in just a day if a patient's infected with the flu or the new coronavirus. Oh, so this is it. Uh, yeah, exactly. And At Public Health Ontario, they're working overtime. So Lab workers have received over a dozen nose and throat swabs from potentially infected patients. From those samples, they're snipping out a portion of genetic material for testing. I think we've had six requests today alone. The virus blueprints look a lot like barcodes. One from the patient, the other represents the new coronavirus. Is it a matter of seeing how closely these align and match? Exactly. So what you want for a patient sample, you want to see if there's a bar at the same place. If a specific bar in the code lines up and that's a match, scientists then zoom in on the viral letter code to see if the person is infected or not. So it's sort of like a two-step matching. Exactly, and that's why it takes 24 hours as we need that second step. This type of test wasn't available during the height of the SARS epidemic and could save lives by stopping the spread. We weren't starting from scratch in the way that we could have been doing before. And then also the technologies allow us to do things faster. What are they, four or five years old? Every sample tested for the new coronavirus is then being sent to the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg. Labs across the country are now working 24 hours a day, expecting that at some point there will be a positive match for the new coronavirus. Okay, Christine, so tracking the spread is one thing. What about how dangerous this virus is? It's still early days, but we do know that about 25% of people infected with this new coronavirus who've shown up in Chinese hospitals are severely ill, and about 4% of them are dying. By comparison, 20% of people infected with SARS died. So it does seem that this virus is less severe. We also heard from the World Health Organization today that many of the people who have died had underlying health conditions. So their immune system was compromised for one reason or another, which does underscore what we're hearing from Canadian health authorities in that the risk here is low, but it is still early days right. and the situation is evolving. Okay, Christine, thanks very much. You're welcome. Well, the Lunar New Year is Saturday. That means lots of people traveling to and from China and also here within Canada. And despite advice to the contrary, seems a number of people are trying to take matters into their own hands. Tina Lovegreen shows us how from Vancouver. At Vancouver's arrivals gate, a lot of people wear their concern on their faces. We, we put on some masks everywhere. <laughs> In fact, so many people are concerned, those face masks are almost impossible to find. We had a, a small amount and we sold out quickly. Tired of repeating themselves, pharmacists let signs do the talking. Yeah, a lot of them have been to other pharmacies, they were sold out as well. Right now, people are coming, you know, from China back here for uh, Chinese New Year. David Lin has been searching for masks to protect his family during the celebrations. Uh, the salespeople at the shoppers told me, uh, uh, is there somebody from the airport, probably, is there somebody traveling or whatever, they need lots of masks, they're probably traveling back to China, right, or Asia somewhere. These are the types of masks that are flying off the shelves at pharmacies, and even though they're in high demand, the BC Centre for Disease Control is recommending most people not to wear them. If they themselves are sick, uh, we ask that a mask be placed on them to prevent them from infecting other people in that healthcare setting. Some people are rethinking their travel plans. They're concerned. And, um, you know, what will be uh, the situation for their traveling when they're in China? There's a lot we don't know about this virus and we don't, we don't know about its spread. Um, you know, probably the real risk may be low, but, you know, it's probably better to wait till this dies down and maybe travel later on in the year. The risk may be low, but still, cause to be alert. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Richmond, B.C. The Conservative Party of Canada's leadership race has barely started, but to follow this week's twists and turns, you risk whiplash. Announcements from three favourites over three days delivered three surprises. Jean Charest, out. Rana Ambrose, out. Today, it was Pierre Polyèvre. Hannah Thibodeau looks at who benefits from that. Another perceived frontrunner has suddenly dropped out of the race. Ontario MP Pierre Polyev shocked everyone with a statement on Facebook. I knew it would be hard on my family life to do this, but I did not realize how hard. It goes on to say, as such, my heart is not fully engaged in this leadership race. Without being all in, 
I cannot be in at all. He's starting to realize now, I think, how, how incredible, how significant the impact of yet another campaign would be on his life. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it, it's good for him to make that decision now before he formally enters. But just yesterday, all systems were go. His team was in place and reporters were told his official campaign launch would take place this Sunday. The Ottawa venue was booked and it's no secret Polyev had big ambitions. Pierre came out of the womb uh, getting ready to run for prime minister. So I the official never, story uh, raises uh, questions. Well, my spidey senses uh, say that uh, when uh, uh, something doesn't add up, there's usually a part of the equation you're missing. And um, uh, those things are often personal and, and sometimes they're just, you know, getting cold feet. Candidates aren't obligated to, uh, uh, to say all of those reasons uh, out loud and put them in a press release. Aaron O'Toole's team says this is now a two-person race, while other conservatives say it could be a coronation. I think it's uh, ultimately Peter McKay's race to lose. There's some benefit for being a front runner and having the momentum behind you, uh, but there's also means you're gonna be the person who probably gets attacked the most by others who are gonna try and eat into that support. With three conservative heavyweights now out, there's room for others. Perhaps other big names who put their ambitions on hold and are now reconsidering. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. So what does all this mean for the future of the Conservative Party? Well, it's a good thing it's Thursday. Rosie and that issue will be here later in the program to talk about the latest turn of events. That's in about 20 minutes. Some dramatic moments today at the trial of Harvey Weinstein on sex-related charges. The disgraced producer, once a Hollywood powerhouse, had no choice but to listen as a witness seated just meters away gave a detailed account of how he allegedly raped her. Stephen D'Souza was in the courtroom to see it all. He's black. In the early 90s, Annabella Sciorra was breaking through in Hollywood with roles in films like Jungle Fever. Today, she was the first Harvey Weinstein accuser to face the producer in court. Pausing frequently to fight back tears, she testified how Weinstein unexpectedly burst into her apartment, forced her onto the bed, and raped her. I said, no, no, but there was not much I could do at that point. My body shut down. It was just so disgusting, my body started to shake. After the alleged assault, Shiora said she began drinking, even cutting herself. A few weeks later, Shiora testified she confronted Weinstein about what happened, saying she had blacked out. She told the court he replied, that's what all nice Catholic girls say. Then he leaned in menacingly, this remains between you and I. Shiora's accusation dates back to the winter of 1993 or 1994, beyond the statute of limitations. So she's one of four witnesses the judge is allowing the prosecution to use to try to establish that Weinstein had a pattern as a predator. Weinstein's lawyer pressed Shiora on details, questioning her actions before and after the encounter. When you woke up, did you go to the police? No. When you woke up, did you go to the doctor? No. When you woke up, did you go to the hospital? No. I feel for her. It's not easy. Uh, I think the defense is going very quickly, hoping to have her trip up. So far, I don't think that she has. The defense also played this clip. You hear the same question over and over again. And, and yeah. so to just kind of liven things, if you try and invent different <laughs> answers, you do, do much of that? <laughs> trying to insinuate that Shiora may be prone to telling tall tales. I was caught uh, recently and uh, in the last couple of years lying about quite a few things. You just fib in the interview. Yeah. yeah. The prosecution and Shiora dismissed the clip as not related in any way to her accusation against Weinstein. So Stephen, you were there in the courtroom again today. Can you walk us through what happened when Annabella Shiora gave her detailed account of allegedly being raped by Weinstein? It was a dramatic moment. People were hanging on her every word, including the jury. You could see how attentively they were listening to her. Interestingly, though, Harvey Weinstein himself wasn't looking directly at Annabella Shiora, sort of had his attention focused in a different direction, though he was listening closely. What was interesting was when his lawyer, Donna Rattuno, began her cross-examination, he physically turned his body to face them in the courtroom, really taking in everything she was saying as his lawyer cross-examined Annabella Shiora. And now Weinstein will have to listen to five additional witnesses tell their allegations against him coming up in the uh, following weeks. It's going to be quite dramatic again. All right, Stephen, thanks very much for this. You're welcome.
In Vancouver today, the extradition hearing for Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou came to an end for now. Canada arrested her more than a year ago at the request of the United States, which wants to prosecute her for fraud. The focus this week, would what she's accused of doing be considered a crime in Canada? The judge says she is reserving her decision. The next phase of the hearing is scheduled for June. Well, six days after being smothered under a record-breaking snowfall, St. John's is still pulling itself to its feet. We still have schools that are closed. We still have government offices that are closed. We still have businesses that's closed. The Premier says he's reached out to Ottawa for federal assistance, mainly for repairs to damaged infrastructure. The state of emergency in St. John's, meanwhile, is expected to continue until Saturday. Part of the reason why is that cities can't just sprint from a standstill. Roads, services, businesses are still disrupted. And as Chris O'Neill Yates shows us, bottlenecks and delays affect everything from unpaid wages to unburied bodies. Robert Bailey's skincare business remains at a standstill, so he's busy making stock. The whole month has been impacted with the weather besides the normal drop off of business that happens in January. The city of St. John says it's not safe to lift a state of emergency. Snow clearing crews are working around the clock. Right now we're just in a holding pattern, we're waiting. The restriction on mail delivery has been lifted, but mailboxes are inaccessible because clearing streets is the priority. We know there's a lot of stuff in the mail. Uh, there's social economical checks, there's medical supplies, there's gifts from Nan and Pop. We deliver almost anything and right now we can't do our job. A lot of people have been off work the past week. Many of them will be out wages. To get some relief for them, the Premier is working with Ottawa. And see what programs and provisions could be made possible uh, for, employ for small business owners. And, but primarily right now, the focus for me would be on, on the uh, lost wages and our low-income earners. Healthcare is crawling back to full capacity. People who had outpatient or ambulatory specialist appointments, uh, we've been uh, triaging those to understand who the most uh, serious folks are that needed to be seen. Public transit is still shut down. Schools and universities are closed. The semester frozen in place. I got a little bit of cabin fever. I was stuck inside for probably like four days before going outside. Even funerals have had to be postponed. We have 20, 20 people in the building right now. That could be an urn or a person. But I mean, that's quite a amount of people there that are awaiting services. Despite the inconvenience, those living with the storm seem to be taking it all in stride. Robert Bailey hopes that when the state of emergency is lifted on Saturday, people will feel the urge to shop and he'll make up for some lost business. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. Coming up, the environmental mess lurking underground in Alberta. We don't know if it's safe, we don't know if it's leaking. Why no one can afford to clean it up. Crisis at the Grammys. For me, that's just such a blatant conflict of interest. The ousted CEO claims the awards are rigged, and it doesn't end there. A stolen dog which got itself rescued. Oh my gosh, I can talk about that story without crying. We're back in two. Lizzo is one of the artists set to perform at the Grammys on Sunday. She also leads the nominations. And that she's riding so high going in was seen as a sign that maybe the Grammys are changing with the times, more accepting, more open. But tonight, those very same iconic awards are facing a credibility crisis. The allegation from an ousted CEO that the awards are rigged. Deanna Sumanak Johnson explains. The Grammy goes to... The Grammy stage has seen some surprising moments, but according to the recently departed CEO, things are more surprising behind the scenes. So rigged is a term you would apply to it? Or yes, not? it is. Deborah Dugan talked about the mostly male, mostly white committees where a list of contenders is whittled down to nominees. In that room, not only are there trustees that have uh, conflict of interest on particular artists that are nominated, but more importantly, there are even artists that are nominated that are in the room. Uh, so for me, that's just such a blatant conflict of interest. In a statement, the Academy called the accusations categorically false, misleading and wrong. Dugan care. was hired just last year to lead the Grammys to a brighter future. They initiated a bunch of uh, plans to diversify. 
including a task force and bringing in a new president and CEO. That was Deborah Dugan. Then last week, Dugan was out too for allegedly bullying staff. Her response was swift, filing a lawsuit against the Academy stacked with accusations, among the most serious, that Neil Portnow, the man Dugan replaced, sexually assaulted a female artist, an allegation Portnow called ludicrous and untrue. Dugan's lawsuit alleges she was ousted after raising allegations of sexual harassment and irregularities in the nomination process. She called it an old boys club. We were expecting to see an awful lot of changes at the Grammys, and it appears what has happened is they made statements and gestures for change, but we're hearing that they're not very effective, and the person who was brought in to enact those changes just got deposed. For Grammys, the TV show just might be the winner here, as people tune in to see if the artists will weigh in on the implosion of once most revered institution in music. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. To some other stories now making news across the country tonight. This is like a, an initiative from um, uh, our government to make sure that everybody plays by the same rules. Quebec has announced stricter rules and training for tourism operators, making it mandatory for all guides and their clients to complete courses before handling off-road vehicles. That news comes after five French tourists fell through the ice while snowmobiling on Lac Saint-Jean Tuesday night. Provincial police say they found another four snowmobiles in the water today. There is still no sign of the missing men. Uber and Lyft have finally received the green light to operate in parts of BC. I think it's a great idea. I myself uh, stopped taking taxis a long time ago. Uh, it's just absolutely crazy that it's taken this long, but I'm not really that surprised. So this is a long-awaited announcement for commuters clamoring for ride-hailing in the province. For nearly a decade, both companies have said they would begin operations within days. Now, so far, they're only allowed to operate in the lower mainland and Whistler regions, meaning there won't be ride-hailing in the province's north or interior anytime soon. And Alberta's privacy commissioner has launched an investigation into a new ID scanning system being tested out in a few Edmonton liquor stores. That system forces customers to scan their government ID before they can enter the store. And the store owners say the pilot project was implemented in response to a dramatic escalation in liquor store robberies over the past year. Critics, however, have denounced this, saying it's a major encroachment on privacy rights. And up next on The National, righting historic wrongs in Quebec, the neighborhood that still has property documents with a ban on Jewish residents. And another high-profile conservative is out of the race before it even gets started. You know you'll want at issue's take. Rosie and the gang are standing by. The Jewish people have learned the lessons of the Holocaust to take, always to take, seriously the threats of those who seek our destruction. World leaders gathered at the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem today to mark the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Many called for a global fight against the current rise of anti-Semitism around the globe. Before the Nazi death camp was taken by Soviet forces, more than a million people died there, the vast majority of them Jewish. One town near Montreal is grappling with its own anti-Semitic past. A late landowner used legal documents to prevent Jews from buying his land. That legacy now haunts the current owners. Alison Northcott explains the effort to remove other reminders of the man. When this couple bought their home, there was a clause attached to the property that it couldn't be sold or rented to anyone who is Jewish. I'm not really happy about it, and I think it should be removed. This land was once owned by Alphonse Wagner. He sold it off in parcels in the 1950s and 60s with that discriminatory clause included. La clause Alphonse has trouvé ici. And it's still there today. Notary Cal Goulet recently saw it attached to one of his client's properties, and even though it's not enforceable, he had a judge remove it, but it still lingers for other homeowners. Wagnall's 99-year-old son says his father had the clause added to please buyers at the time. He wanted to buy it with these conditions. 
That's so powerful. Heidi Berger says clauses like that are just That's one really example cool. of the anti-Semitism families like hers have long faced. She says her mother, a Holocaust survivor, had a hard time buying a house in Quebec's Laurentian region in the 1960s. She had to pretend that she wasn't Jewish. No French or English person was selling a property to a Jew. So she put on a cross, pretended she was Catholic. But the property clause isn't the only concern. The city also has a street and a park named after Wagnall, and some want that changed. It wasn't correct then, uh, back then. It's not correct now. And to me, it's fighting anti-Semitism. Wagnall's son says he has no problem with people removing the clause, but he wants the street name to stay. Residents are split on the name change, but the mayor wants all of the discriminatory language removed from their properties. It's disgusting. We don't. We don't. Uh, it makes no sense that uh, that kind of clause still uh, in uh, alive today. The mayor says he's all for changing the names of the street and the park, but says the city will consult with residents before they make a final decision. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Saint Jean sur Richelieu, Quebec. Up next, Pierre Polyev is out. Same goes for Ron Ambrose and Jean Charest. So is this Peter McKay's leadership race to win? Rosie will ask at issue right after this. It's still very early days in the conservative leadership race, but already the story has become who's not in, in fact, who's out. Jean Charest, Rana Ambrose, and just tonight, Pierre Poiliev. So for the latest on the twists and turns of this leadership race in its early days, uh, let's go to our at issue panel. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal, of course. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto, and Althea Raj is here with me in Ottawa. Good to see you all. Um, I was trying to talk about something else this week, but failed <laughs> because the conservatives have decided to make their leadership race uh, very interesting in the early days, but sort of interesting because of who has decided not to get in. So so I guess let's start with this latest one, Pierre Poiliev, who we believed was, was ready to announce um, this coming Sunday and put out this Facebook statement saying that uh, he was not. What, what should we make of this? Uh, I'll start with Andrew. Uh, it's difficult to know what to make of it. He was apparently on the verge of announcing. He had hired staff. He'd mapped out a campaign plan, uh, and then suddenly you decide that you uh, have a one-year-old child and you'd like to spend more time with your family. Um, you know, you don't want to take somebody, not take them at their word, but it's extremely hard to believe. Well, it, it's also a little curious because of all the interviews that he had given, particularly where you are, Chantal, in Quebec over the past week or so, where he had performed very well and people were saying that he had a good chance to pick up support in Quebec. So uh, I guess I'm still left with more questions for Mr. Poilier. Well, uh Yes, uh, but uh, saying he had go a good chance to pick up support in Quebec was contingent, I guess, on a number of conditions. Um, uh, and one of those was that uh, he would fa face a split opposition, uh, Jean Charest and mm. Peter McKay splitting up uh, the kind of progressive conservative vote, et cetera, et cetera. I can't read into uh, his motives for not running, no. but yeah. it is not the first time that I see a candidate decide on the eve of announcing uh, to, pull, to pull back. It does mm -hmm. happen. So I, I'm not making a big deal out of it, but I mm -hmm. do note that uh, Peter McKay had a good week this week, but I'm not sure that the Conservative Party is having the greatest week. Well, I think that's an awfully good point. And, and Althea, when you talk to conservatives, they're sort of perplexed as to how this is already unfolding. A lot of people who I would say are on the more like right side of the conservative party are uh, feeling a little bit disappointed because it doesn't look like they are going to have a candidate that reflects them, the kind of Stephen Harper continuity. And I, I feel like we're this is like a a discussion of different shades of conservatism, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I actually don't think Peter McKay is perhaps as progressive conservative as people think, you know, when they, like, he's not a, a Joe Clark pc -er, of course. Um, but there are certainly some people in the party who are not huge Peter McKay fans and who were looking forward uh, to backing somebody like Pierre Poiliev, um, yes. and now they are not going to have that opportunity. Aaron O'Toole um, is kind of maybe a bit more on the Pierre Poiliev side. He's 
uh, hasn't formally announced, but um, seems like he might be. But, you know, again, this week we have learned <laughs> not to put too much stock in what, pe you know, even if people have campaign teams, yeah. like Monsieur Charest, who seems to have suddenly realized after looking at the math that um, the party doesn't reflect the, his values or um, and you know, selling 100,000 memberships in two months seemed to be a pretty large uh, task. So, um, so what, what, what does that tell us then about, about what's going on uh, inside the party, Andrew? Does it, tell, does it tell us anything? I mean, I think it certainly gets us wondering. <laughs> certain, so what, what does it tell you or suggest to you? Well, I mean, I don't know what to make of it. We don't know what any of these people really stand for. Even after uh, Peter McKay's years in public life and Aaron O'Toole's years in public life, we don't know a great deal about what they stand for. The, you know, some of us were hoping that this leadership race would be an opportunity for the party to really debate its future direction and to mm. hash, hash through some really fundamental questions about what it stands for, what kind of mix of policies. Mm -hmm. If, as it is now appearing, it's going to be some sort of Peter McKay coronation, that sort of rather short circuits that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a, it's a real missed opportunity, not an entirely surprising one, because that's often how these leadership races work out, is whoever has the most guns lined up at the first scares off some of the other candidates. Right. Um, the rules have, of course, been set in ways to keep certain types of candidates out. And so instead of that kind of robust exchange of views, um, it, it becomes a popularity contest. But, but isn't that the worst thing that could happen here, Chantal, is that the Conservative Party doesn't take the time to talk about what Andrew's talking about, what Althea's talking about, the shades of grey inside the Conservative Party? If it, if it doesn't do that, I, what, you know, where does that leave it in a general election? I'm not sure that it was uh, that the Conservative Party was ready to do that under just about any scenario. I think that uh, the party for that to happen, and I'm not saying they would have bought a very different vision, would have needed a candidate of stature uh, to force that discussion upon the party. I'm not mm -hmm. sure that's going to happen. But I think the, the <clears throat> biggest problem at this point is that if Peter McKay, for instance, is going to become leader, it would be healthier for the party and for Peter McKay that someone strong kick the tires sure, uh, yeah. under his leadership bid. And if that is not going to happen, I think it's the party's loss uh, and it's his loss too. It could still happen, though, Althea. I mean, there's there's still plenty of time for people to emerge, there. I suppose. But but if if there's not a real race, I, 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 I would tend to agree with Chantal. I'm not sure where that leaves Peter McKay. Well, there's a month, and the yes. way the rules are set, the possibility of something, somebody coming out of left field uh, with, who really believes they have a shot of winning this is very, very slim. What's interesting about this contest is that usually people, you know, they put their name in the contest, and then they kind of, like, back out after a while. So they have, they use... The, the platform the leadership race provides them to put forward their ideas. You can think of, like, Marc Garneau or Martha Hall Finley during the leadership race that Justin Trudeau basically was coronated at. I mean, there was, um, Joyce Murray was, I think, left, that's it, at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have a robust debate of ideas, for sure. But the rethink seems to, maybe we'll only just be talking about gay marriage and abortion, yeah, and, yeah. and that's it, because the only contestants coming out seem to be uh, on that side of the party. Chantal, yeah. I don't think, uh, for the Conservatives, it would be a nightmare if the yes. campaign mostly revolved around uh, fi fending off the idea that it uh, is a party that is open to going back to the mm -hmm. era prior to same-sex marriage and reopening all those debates. And I believe that uh, uh, were a, a, a French candidate to rise out of uh, uh, some mess and become leader, a uh, large section of the caucus would not serve under such a, a, yeah, a yeah. candidate. But the, the fact that, that, that so many people who seemed uh, viable, uh, at least on the surface, including Ron Ambrose, Andrew, ha have decided not to do it, does, does it make us think that the Conservative Party is, I don't know, that, that, it, that it can't get where it needs to go in time for the next election? Or what, I mean, how should I interpret that? <laughs> No, I mean, I, they are. They came out of that last election in relatively good shape. That may yes, be yeah. part of the problem in terms of not being willing to go undergo the kind of really, real rethink you mm -hmm. do when you, when you've really been beaten badly. Sure. Um, you know, Peter McKay fought long and hard to preserve this uh, equal weighted riding um, system of, of electing leaders through over many years, uh, and it may be paying dividends for him that <laughs> that. Uh, 
you know, if it was just one person, one vote, he might not be quite so formidable candidate, a candidate. I don't think he'd win a lot of votes in the West among kind of rock-ribbed conservatives in the West. But he can do very well in eastern Canada, and that may be what's scaring off some other candidates. Just one last go around. I mean, I, I, we, know, we know that, that Stephen Harper is watching things closely. How closely, I think, is a, is a matter of debate. But I, I wonder what in the world he's thinking, uh, it, you know, as he watches these people, some that he would have probably been okay being leader and some not so much. Um, <laughs> Althea, you don't have to go into Stephen Harper's brain, but I, I just I, well, that occur, that occurs to me. Like, what what could he be thinking right now? I'm told that the two actually were quite close, um, and that that might surprise some people to hear. But that they did actually hang out together in the Ottawa. Two, the, who are the two you're talking about here? Stephen Harper and Peter McKay. Um, okay. And that uh, you know when Mr. McKay, uh, Mr. Harper chose to go uh, to Mr. McKay's writing when Mr. McKay announced that he was leaving, that that was something that Mr. Harper felt was important mm. to him to do to show his support. That he didn't yeah. um, do it for you know political reasons, but he did it for friendship reasons. Um, and so I don't think Mr. Harper uh, would feel badly about having Mr. McKay win this leadership. Chantal, you look like you want to say something. <laughs> well, I, you know, if you look at social media tonight, it's full of uh, Stephen Harper is coming back uh, kind of, of stories, which yeah. I don't think are based on anything uh, that is factual. But uh, I do believe the two of them have worked uh, together in the past. Peter McKay did not oppose Stephen Harper when he wanted to lead mm -hmm. the reunited Conservative Party and gave up his leadership. So there, there are IOUs in there somewhere yes, that could go sure. a long way to unite the party behind McKay. Yeah, I think Stephen Harper has to wear some of the weakness of the Tory bench, though. They were in power for 10 years. That was an opportunity for him to build up cabinet ministers, potential successors. Uh, conservative parties always have that um, um, disadvantage relative to liberals because the liberals are so often in power that it's very easy for them to recruit top flight talent. Conservatives are always at a disadvantage. But when they were in power, I think Harper could have done a better job of recruiting uh, high profile talented people to his side. And I think that is partly what we're seeing in, in both in this race and 2017. Okay, I'll leave it there, everybody. Thank you. We'll, we'll try and talk about a different topic next week, but who knows? The Conservatives are keeping life interesting, <laughs> so that's okay with me. Thank you all. And before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we're looking ahead to the return of Parliament and what it means for this minority government. Look for it on any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. All right, so as you can already likely tell, Andrew and I are here with you together Monday through Thursday, except, of course, when one of us is on assignment. Yeah, so what that means, on Fridays and Sundays, Ian's got the helm and working stuff up for those days right now. So, Ian, what's happening tomorrow? Well, Andrew, the lead story tonight, the spread of the coronavirus, continues to develop, as you know, each day. So we'll be watching that, of course. And we're going to put some of the pressing questions that have come up in the last couple of days to doctors. The latest on how the virus is spreading and what we in Canada need to be prepared for. Okay, looking forward to it. Still to come this hour, thousands of environmental time bombs abandoned. Why taxpayers may have to foot the bill. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, the alleged inside story of what happened to Patrick Matthews, the former Canadian reservist with links to white supremacist group The Base. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. In Alberta, unused oil and gas wells linger and sometimes leak, ensuring leftover wells are cleaned up is the province's job with industry footing the bill. But it turns out the province didn't collect enough money for that, and the environmental cost now looming is vast. Kyle Bax looks at Alberta's struggle to figure out how this happened and who's going to pay for it. In the middle of Dwight Popowich's field is a problem he's powerless to solve. This natural gas well hasn't produced anything in almost two years, and the company who owns it is bankrupt. Just put padlocks on it. Turned it off and walked away from it. There's nobody in charge of this thing. We don't know if it's safe. We don't know if it's leaking. Nobody's showing up to even take a look at it. Neglected oil and gas wells are all too common in Alberta. There are 94,000 inactive wells, the majority of which will likely never produce oil or gas again. And another 3,000 orphan wells where the owner went belly up. Popovich would love to sell some of his land to help pay for his retirement. But with this well, nobody's interested. Decommissioning a well can cost between $100,000 and half a million. 
he has no idea when it will ever be cleaned up. Our past governments really weren't doing the oversight. They let the industry basically do its own thing, self-regulate. And we've ended up with this mess as a result. Here's one reason why. Alberta's energy regulator is supposed to collect security deposits from struggling oil and gas companies to make sure if they fail, there's money on hand to clean up the wells. But it's been using an outdated calculation. That means it's collected millions instead of the billions needed. We shouldn't have gotten into this mess. Wholesale changes are required, says this expert. This system is just not... It's not sustainable, it's not functioning, and so it's going to have to completely be thrown out the window, which is, but it's many t years too late. For solutions, Alberta might want to look south. North Dakota is the second largest oil producing state in the U.S. Here, every company must pay a deposit before a well is even drilled, whereas in Alberta, wealthier companies get a free pass. There are also stricter timelines. If a well stops producing for as little as three months, it's immediately flagged. As a result, North Dakota has fewer than 2,000 inactive wells, and there aren't any orphan wells, not a single one. The state's demand of a deposit up front hasn't hurt the industry's appetite to drill either. Investment has continued. It's been a little slower, but it has continued. North Dakota produces about half as much oil as Alberta. Still, the contrast is striking. Alberta could try to play catch-up by demanding the industry ante up more money now, but some fear that could push some companies over the brink. I've referred to it as a Goldilocks zone. You know, we, we want to see progress on the file, but you really have to manage the unintended consequences. You don't want to create more defaults. There are a lot of companies struggling. Now Alberta's Auditor General is stepping in to examine how the problem was allowed to spiral and how to fix it before it gets worse. Is the program designed to be able to handle an influx of uh, additional abandoned sites? Um, can they manage this? What is the risk to Albertans in terms of financial, environmental, and public health and safety risks? That audit will also look at how other regulators are having more success than Alberta at protecting taxpayers from a large bill to clean up old oil and gas wells. All as the province asks Ottawa for more help paying for the problem it already has. Kyle Bax, CBC News, near Two Hills, Alberta. Okay, up next, a five-month-old puppy disappears from its backyard. I would have lose my dog forever. But the alleged thieves did not expect to meet a dog whisperer. That moment, right after this. Australian Shepherds are known as one of the smarter kinds of dogs out there. And something remarkable happened when one of them was dognapped in Gatineau, Quebec. You see, he almost seemed to alert staff at a local pet store that he had been stolen and by the very people who brought him in, posing as his owners. His name is Vango, and his story is our moment. Customers that we see usually uh, maybe two times a month, and I was surprised when they came in the store with a dog. I was shocked a little bit. I was, uh, since when you have a dog? At the same time, the dog was barking, or he was try to say, hello, I'm here. Uh, I'm not the dog that is saying the, uh, I am. My uh, co-worker, Lydia, told me to go uh, come see her. And uh, she showed me a post that the dog was uh, maybe missing or had been stolen. And with um, more authority, I asked, where are you about the dog? I need to know. At that time, I said, Van Gogh, come. And the dog quickly react. Oh my gosh, I can talk about that story without crying. <laughs> If those person didn't go to that pet store, mm -hmm. I would have lose my dog forever. Hmm. Okay, really important that they went to that pet store because yeah. the, the pet store owner, completely coincidentally, had happened to train that puppy when he was really, really little. Unbelievable. And so he, he knew the owner, knew the puppy, and just, just had that sense. And yet, I mean, you, well, you talk about sense, yeah. right? I mean, what a spidey sense that he must have had in that moment. To, a, to notice that, that something was off, and, mm -hmm. and maybe Van Gogh gets some of the credit there. But then that, that, I mean, he and his staff had the presence of mind to check, to find a Facebook post about a lost dog, and then to be so bold as to confront the... You gotta love what you do, right? <laughs> it's, it's really something.
That's the National for this January 23rd. Have a great night. Good night.